every path that I went down took me back to regenerative agriculture. Using ruminant animals, using agriculture that was giving the soil the opportunity to heal and to work holistically in an ecosystem that can heal itself and not just heal itself, but can give back in dividends. This is a slow way to do things. It's such a unique way, and I feel like we're paving a path forward. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Good morning, Mom. Good morning, Emma. I'm really missing the boat today. I just got back from vacation on a boat, and it was... The best time of my life ever. <laughs> boat. You should tell them what kind of boat. It's not just any boat. Yes. So I went sailing in Maine. I wasn't doing the sailing. I was a passenger on a sailing vessel, an old 120-year-old wooden schooner built by hand. And it is still sailing today in Maine. It was actually made here in the Chesapeake Bay, which is fascinating. And it's had a long, industrious life. And now it takes passengers around the Penobscot Bay in Maine on something called wind jamming cruises, which I'd never heard of. I think Maine people know what this is and maybe New England people, but I've never heard of wind jamming. Had you ever heard of wind jamming, mom? I had not at all. It's literally what it sounds like. Pleasure cruises for people to go out on these old wooden boats that aren't used anymore to haul cargo. But in the 40s and 50s, there were certain people that understood that these vessels were important historical artifacts and to preserve them, they wanted to offer this experience for people to both see the coastline and have time out on sea. And it's very common to do little like day cruises, but wind jamming is generally an overnight thing. So you sleep on the boat and they cook all your meals. It's just, it is heaven. And it is very, in my opinion, slow travel. There's no motors. You use the wind. When there's no wind, there is a little tiny motor boat that sort of pushes the boat. But the day is dictated literally wherever the wind blows you. They don't really make a plan for oh, I love that. where you're going. <laughs> it <laughs> sounds wonderful. like truly sustainable travel. It really is. I think so. And all the food on board was so good and fresh. And we didn't make much trash. All the plates are real plates and forks. It's Isn't it funny how that's a novelty? Yeah. So, yeah. It's a luxury, really. But yeah, I definitely want to shout out wind jamming in general and also this vessel, the Victory Chimes, which very bittersweetly we learned yesterday, the press release went out that this will be its last season for that particular boat. Oh, so, no. Oh. And you're hearing this, dear listeners, you might be able to jump on the last cruise ever that it will take. <laughs> I recommend it. If not, there are other boats that do similar sailing trips. I know in Maine, and I'm sure in other parts of the world too, it's something that I want to be doing every year if I can. It would be fun to highlight this this type of travel is what you say, like a, a slow living experience because there's really it truly is not much to do on the boat, is there? You just, you can read or relax or play music or walk around Yes. Uh, it's so funny because, yeah, there's quote unquote, not much to do, but really it's all of the best things to do. Cam, my partner and travel buddy, wrote a really good review on Google. He sums it up really well. He says, things to do on board include, and this is what you're saying, mom, seal and porpoise spotting, helping with the operation of the ship, which you can do some heaving and hoeing if you want to, 
stargazing, storytelling, eating, island appreciating, swimming and refreshingly frigid waters, friend making, rowing <laughs> boats with those new friends, sleeping on deck, listening to live music, dancing and or singing to said music. Your experience will ultimately be different from mine. This is a handmade vacation. It's not perfect. It's better. Oh, I love that. It's not perfect. It's better. I know. And the idea being that because it's handmade and literally that the ship, the experience, what you do during the day, it's all just the good stuff. And for us, the best thing was there's no decisions to make. Yeah. Except do you want to jump in or do you want to sit here and talk? It's so great. So all that to say, I really got a taste of my own medicine on this slow living travel experience where less is truly more. It's really something to think about when travel and trips and going different places, there's a lot to do. Figure out what you're going to eat, figure out what you're going to do, how to spend mm -hmm. the time you have. And as you say, in this instance, there's only so much you can do and yeah. you don't have so many of those decisions to make. So yeah, what a great idea. I want to do one. I want to go on a wind jamming cruise. Maybe we'll do a good dirt cruise. Oh, Wow, what a great How idea. How many of you out there would come join us? Let us yeah, know. Let us know. Yeah. Wind jamming. Oh, my gosh. Heaven. Wind jamming. Okay. So as the summer season is coming to a close, not too much time for wind jamming left, but that's okay. Fall yeah. equinox is the next week. Fall equinox, yes. Actually, next Thursday, September 22nd, and it happens at 9.04 p.m. Eastern daylight time in the northern hemisphere and what happens during the fall equinox do you know emma exactly what happens is this the one where if you put an egg on the table it'll stand up straight ah yes remember we used to try that in the yeah. mornings before you went to school on the day of the fall equinox we would try to balance the egg i think sometimes it worked but <laughs> i actually looked into that and the truth is that you can balance an egg on its end on any day Oh. Actually, but anyway, I don't know how that got started about that story about balancing the egg. But what does happen during the fall equinox is that it's a moment in time when the sun is directly above the equator. So the northern and southern hemispheres get the same amount of sun. So that's what's happening there in that little mm -hmm. couple of minutes when it shifts from one season to another. And mythologically, when Persephone has come out for... She came out during spring, right? In yes. The summer? Yes. Persephone had joined her mother in the spring and spent a beautiful summer. And then on the day of the fall equinox, it's time for her to go back to her husband, Hades, to the underworld. Ooh. So as you all know, if you've been listening in the Almanac, which is our online slow living community, we of course have a new theme for fall. And this theme is shift as we shift into the new season in so many different ways. And we'd love to have you join us if you're interested in slow living and anything that we talk about here on The Good Dirt. Your membership in the Almanac is really what keeps this podcast going. And also there's a beautiful community in there with lots of engaged conversation. And we have a book club and we share recipes and photos and ideas. And just this morning, we chatted about all of the beautiful things that we'll be publishing this fall in the Almanac. And it's really amazing. It's like its own little quarterly magazine that we do in there. I hope that you'll join us. To join, you can go to the link in our show notes. You can go to ladyfarmer.com slash community, and you can become a monthly or an annual member. And we just know you're going to love it. Thank you so much for supporting the show and supporting what we do here. So please do join us for all the wonderful things we have going on in there. And we know that the people that listen to this podcast are going to love the Almanac because it's just all of the topics we all love talking about so much and discussing and thinking about and dreaming about. And this is where it's at. So come join our community and help us shift the paradigm. Ooh, the, good one. Yeah, good one. <laughs> so moving on to today's episode. This is a really interesting one and great conversation. Our guests today are Janessa Leone, who's the founder of the sustainable luxury brand, Janessa Leone. 
And Rachel can too. She's the supply chain and sustainability advisor for the company. And she's also founder of Simplify and Grow Business Consulting. Janessa Leone makes beautiful, thoughtful products with impact in mind. So she mostly makes hats and accessories and knits. And I actually wore my Janessa Leone sweater on the boat. It was the perfect thing in Maine. And I've worn it a lot this summer. I think I mentioned in this interview too, I have found out this summer that you can wear wool in the summer if it's a little chilly inside or sometimes there's some cooler mornings. And wool is just extremely insulating in it and temperature regulating. So it's really beautiful. And that sweater is part of the first collection of carbon negative sweaters to be made entirely in the USA. Yes, it is amazing. So Janessa and Rachel have been working together. Rachel is the former senior vice president of the global supply chain at Patagonia. So she comes to Janessa Leone with a lot of expertise in bringing the healing potential of regenerative agriculture back to create a climate beneficial textile supply chain. And we cover a lot of ground in this conversation, including how sustainability and luxury pair together. That's an interesting concept. Janessa's personal journey in this space and what's motivated her to pivot her business in this way. We talk about the tensions around sustainability in the fashion industry, how regenerative business can heal ecosystems, and how to measure impact and share that impact to educate and empower customers. One of the things we love so much about The Good Dirt is meeting all of the creative and forward-thinking business leaders that are using their talents and their expertise to create real and lasting change in these industries And Janessa and Rachel are so inspiring in their dedication to creating a better way. They're literally forging a new path in an industry that makes doing things in a way that is not harmful to the land and other humans extremely challenging. But when faced with that's not how it's done, their response is that this is how it should be done. So that's what we're doing. So settle back and get ready to listen to these two women who have set out to prove that there's another way, a better way, and they are succeeding. Here's Janessa Leone and Rachel Cantu talking about the paradigm shifting goals and practices of the sustainable luxury brand, Janessa Leone. I'm Janessa Leone. I have a fashion brand that is also named Janessa Leone. We're based in Los Angeles. I personally live between LA and Paris. I've been doing this business for about eight years. And in the last couple of years, I've had a bit of a renaissance of understanding what our really our goal and our mission was. And I was introduced to Rachel probably four years ago at this point. I think, Rachel, you might want to correct me if I'm wrong, but We connected and immediately hit it off, and she was able to come in and help some immediate supply chain issues that we were having that just come in tandem with scaling a business. And then we really started to get a little bit more philosophical about our purposes on the planet and what we're doing life about and business for, and really started to join forces to create a really important impact goal, which is creating a luxury brand utilizing regenerative inputs and having a quantifiable fashion brand that can actually quantify our carbon measure, not just our carbon measure, our overall measure. When Rachel and I connected, we really aligned on our impact goals of what we wanted to create in terms of the opportunity to create a luxury brand using regenerative inputs that we could actually quantify the benefit to the soil and the soil health in the entire ecosystem and still will furthermore actually create a better quality product because the inputs and the raw materials were so luxury that being able to create any sort of finished good with such extraordinarily quality materials just made so much sense. So we connected and we've been creating a supply chain Almost from scratch, a lot of partners are doing this and we're seeking them out and coming together, but this is not necessarily the typical way to do business. So we're creating a completely transparent supply chain 
And our goal is by 2030 to have a full like 90% of our raw materials be sourced from regenerative inputs. Wow. So cool. And Rachel, how about you? My name's Rachel Cantu. I am in Washington State right now. I actually live between Washington State and Baja, Mexico. I founded my consulting company, Simplify and Grow, in 2017. Met Janessa not too long after that. But when I founded my business, that was after spending about 20 years working for some familiar brands like Nike and Patagonia. With those brands, I had a chance to really learn and lead and innovate around ways to grow and scale a business and make great products. And over time, obviously in a more sustainable way, I've had a passion for textiles and apparel my entire life for as long as I can remember. And as I learned more and more firsthand working with raw material suppliers, working with supply chain partners all around the world, I just realized more and more how much this industry can have a really negative impact on people, on the environment. But then I'm someone who looks at those things and sees it as an opportunity. And I realized that I really wanted to spend my time, my talent, my efforts working on ways to be a part of the solution. And using that innovation, using contacts that I have to really pour my energy into being of the solution and, and a part of the change. So mm -hmm. that's how I'm here and really enjoying the work that Janessa and I are getting to do together. Thank you so much. I want to say that given the state of the fashion industry, what you both have described is something of a revolution when you say your product actually benefits the environment, it benefits the climate. We know the term sustainability implies that you're just not harming, you're keeping things on an even keel. But when you go one step forward into regeneration and you're healing and you're actually benefiting, talk to us about that and how your production is doing that. What are the ways? Yeah, it's such an important distinction. It's something that has really picked at me over the last couple of years because we're a slow fashion brand. We've always been very intentional with our materials and our partners. We have a wholesale business as well. And when you see different criteria for them to be able to put the sustainable stamp on you, the baseline standard, it's almost laughable at what is considered sustainable. And it's become such a buzzword that it's really harmful, I think. I think that the intent is good. The industry wants something that is going to do no harm. When we talk about sustainability as it is now, it's a moot point. It's not necessarily helping. I'm going to back up a little bit and give a little bit more background on what got me into regenerative because it gives more context of why I decided to do this with the supply chain. I've had some significant chronic health issues over the last couple of years, really my whole life, but really came to a head in the last five years that was in tandem with some grief after I lost my dad very suddenly. And I realized that there was a point in the what the Western medicine world could provide for me. And it really was sustaining health or emergency health. And there was nothing about restoring health or giving my body the raw materials to heal itself. So I had to go onto a journey into figuring out my body is a very well-designed machine that has the potential to heal itself. How do I give it all of the nutrients and saturate it with everything that it is to be able to give it the components for it to do such things? And it led me down the track to regenerative agriculture. So I started to find the most nutrient-dense foods that I could find. And every single, every path that I went down took me back to regenerative agriculture. So I realized, A, my impetus for that was for my own health. But then I started to realize wow, using ruminant animals, using agriculture in a way that was designed to do, really giving the soil the opportunity to heal and to work holistically in an ecosystem that can heal itself and not just heal itself, but can give back in dividends. It's like mm -hmm. putting something in a savings account versus investing, mm -hmm. giving yourself the ability for this to grow exponentially and compounding dividends. And once I saw that, it was just like a click. I've always been, I've had this gift for design and aesthetic, but I've had to justify how do I utilize this gift to the best of my ability, but also not cause harm and not participate in the problem. I make products. Like it's very mm -hmm. hard to make products 
and feel good about that when you're putting more things into the world and utilizing resources. So there was this aha moment that when I was going through my health struggles, I was like, this way that we can do food is the solution. We can heal the soil. The soil will, long after we're gone, if we set it up, it's going to continue to heal and heal. It's going to be compounding interest of what it's doing for the planet. What I'm using, what I'm designing with are organic materials. We use leathers and we use animal products. And everything is really, I just tend to like things that are a lot more simplistic in nature. My design aesthetic is minimalistic. So I was able to really see the through line from using materials such as wool and leather and potentially cotton and these different things that we could go down and be like, wow, we can use what the earth has already given us, utilize ruminant animals, organic growing practices, regenerative growing practices, and we could create a completely transparent supply chain and get a quality product, a better quality product. What right now, how we utilize that in our supply chain, we have a line of regenerative wool sweaters that we created in tandem with a co-op, particularly one group called the Shanika Wool Company. Jeannie Carver, who is the brilliant mind behind this, has created this co-op of farmers that they're, they've been doing this work for 20, 30 years. How long has it been, yeah. Rachel? A long time. But have just recently realized that they have the ability to quantify this by using some soil samples. So they have scientists that are coming out that are taking soil samples before the sheep graze lands and before they move them and they let it sit and they can see a whole year cycle. And they're monitoring carbon, they're monitoring organic matter, they're watering water retention, they're monitoring all these different things. And they can see, and they're already, like their baseline standard is already, they're 30 years ahead of this. They haven't been doing conventional farming on this land. They've been regenerating it for a very long time. And the delta that they can impact in one year is significant. They sent us some numbers. I should pull them up. So just from last year, and Jeannie presented these at the textile exchange conference that it was a textile exchange conference, right, Rachel? Yes. Mm -hmm. In Ireland. And in one year, they've had a combined annual increase of 3.9 tons per acre of carbon across 32,000 acres for a total of 127,360 tons of carbon that's sequestered. So that's equivalent of removing 27,687 cars off the road in one year. Wow. And that's just by the baseline standard. It's hard to measure what the baseline standard is compared to a conventional farm. But you know that if it's 27,000 cars worth in one year, that's an aggregate. They've been doing that year after year. So really, the potential here is powerful. And we really have an opportunity to do something that's monumental. And you both have got the sweaters, like the quality yes. of the fiber. And these are 100% wool. With Rachel's help and genius, we've had a completely localized supply chain. So we're not shipping this to China to get carbonized and shipping it back. And everything from cleaning the wool to spinning it to actually putting it into a finished garment is all done locally in America. So we can really quantify the carbon impact. We have the good that it's doing. We have what it takes to make the carbon. And then we're also creating a product that is 100% wool that's so high quality that at the end of its life is biodegradable because we're not adding anything to it. So end to end, it's just it's a no brainer. And when you put this sweater on you, even if you're not interested in the good that it's doing, it's extraordinarily luxurious. Mm, and yes. for ability of the fineness of the micron that we're able to get, it feels like a cashmere hand and it's wool and it's not itchy. And it's just, it really, to me, just feels as someone that is so focused on luxury and is so driven by luxury and design, that alone is a good enough reason for me to go down this path. And it's mm -hmm. just a win-win that it gets to be extraordinarily beneficial for the planet. And in my view, and I don't mean to be redactive, but in my view is the solution to the climate problem that we're in. So exciting. I think to the point that Janessa was making on quality, it's so interesting because for so many years, the apparel industry has said, sure, we would love to be able to source more locally, but you just can't get the quality of wool in the United States that you need to make luxury product. And so for me, it's really fun <laughs> to be able to say we did it. To piece together the puzzle of all of the partners who are like-minded to us and every partner in this chain plays a critical role in our ability as a brand and the Gen Genesis the only brand to bring this beautiful product 
to the market. The rancher who's working and has been committed to regenerative practices for all of these years, and then the supplier who can clean and comb the wool for us within the United States, and then the supplier who can spin the yarn for us in the United States, and then where we can get the sweaters knitted in the U.S. And all of those steps are all really critical talents and abilities that have been developed individually over the years. And then when we can bring this amazing quality fiber through that whole chain, and in the end, it's this beautiful product that like Janessa said, our customers would want to buy that just by touching it without even knowing the whole story behind it. So for us to be able to bring a luxurious product like that to market that we know is contributing to healing and contributing to healthy ecosystems and really giving back to people who have been committed to doing things, using these practices and doing the right thing for so many years. It's just incredibly satisfying after all of these years having spent this time working in this industry. It makes me excited for what else we're going to be able to do too. You guys are living the dream. It's so exciting. <laughs> we're having a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> we're also very stressed. Hard we too. hear you. We know. <laughs> Janessa, I love hearing about all of this. And I am particularly curious. I want to go back again a little bit to you're starting this line. This You're a designer. You have a brand. My understanding is that it didn't start out this way. Weren't you creating products and then you were woken up to this? And you mentioned that in your opening, but can you tell us a little bit more about that? How did you first hear about it and what was it like switching over and how do you make it all work now? It's a great question. When I first started the business, I knew that I had a very strong conviction of doing business quite differently. I self-funded this. We're still self-funded. I didn't want to take on investors because I wanted to be able to have the full autonomy. It was almost like I had faith that this aha moment was going to come. And I didn't want someone to say that's Mm. the least possible profitable way you could do it, which might be, but (laughs) I had a strong conviction to really run a business differently. And so we've always run things that at that point was a small business. And so it's really easy to do things as sustainable as possible because you're making small quantities and you're working with small artisans. And so we're not necessarily talking about doing harm on a big scale. Once the business started to really scale, I saw first that there was an opportunity because of our client base had grown so much and we had so much more resource. So this all came to a head When I was just having a personal crisis Mm. after my dad passed away, I was struggling with mental health issues, was struggling with severe chronic illness issues. There were so many things in my life that were just this massive storm. And when I was introduced to regenerative agriculture for my health, this all just came together. And there was, I'm also a, a huge animal lover. Like I have a connection with animals in a way that I don't know anyone else that does. Like I see a rat and I'm the person that's just like, oh my gosh, I love you. Try not to come into my house if it's okay, but I absolutely adore you. I just feel so intimately connected to animal. So when we started to work with leathers and I would go to traditional paths because we're at that point, our small brand and you don't get to create your entire leather supply chain, would go to whatever leather vendor that you can find that with the least minimum order quantity that you can afford. And you ask them, where does this cow come from? They can't tell you. There's no transparency. There's absolutely, it's almost like they're offended by the question. It's just, I don't know. They don't even know. These skins, these raw materials are coming from so many different sources that there are people, huge companies that try very hard to trace them and can't. And I understand it's not necessary. It's a systemic flaw in the industry. And so when I was thinking about this from the, all of these issues that were happening in my life, and I'm like, I have this new dedication to spirituality and this new dedication to health and this new dedication to my business and all these things that had this huge moment where I needed to reinvent myself. But then also... I'm looking at my dog, whom I love more than anything. And I can't imagine that the care that I go into treating this <laughs> animal, I don't even know where my cows come for our trims. This is not acceptable. This is not an acceptable way that I want to do my business. And so that's where this all came to a head. And in 2016, really turned things around. This is a slow way to do things because this is not the way that people source fibers. We have our knitwear designers and whenever anything happens with the yarn, we'll talk to them and they're like, 
I don't know. No one I ever know makes their own yarn. That's not a thing that people (laughs) do. Like no one does this in the industry. It's such a unique way. And I feel like we're paving a path forward. But this all turned in 2016 and we've really started to lean into it in the last year when we've defined by 2030, these are our new impact goals that we're working towards. Very cool. And so just to clarify for listeners who might not be familiar, the brand is hats, right? Leather hats. What else? We started with wool hats and then we went into straw hats. We have leather trims on the hats and we have expanded to handbags, belt, sweaters, of course. And we're growing the collections out into different categories as the brand scales. More to come. For the record, as you mentioned, this is like the best sweater I've ever worn. (laughs) I'm obsessed with it. Yes. It's summer right now and I'm wearing it like almost every morning because I wake up and thank goodness for AC. But it is a little chilly in the morning in my house. And so I'll put the sweater on and even earlier in the spring when it was actually cool enough to be wearing it all day, outside i wore it and y'all sent it to me and i wore it like every day for the next like two weeks i love it so much it's a joke me and my boyfriend i kept spilling coffee on it i would like (laughs) spill like every day he's like why are you wearing that gorgeous white sweater you keep spilling stuff on it but i don't it comes out yeah it comes out (laughs) people live out on the pasture they get dirty they know they can clean it (laughs) yeah it really is so great thank you A lot of our listeners don't realize that you can wear wool in the summer because it's temperature regulating. Everybody thinks it's just like super warm, but it's actually temperature regulating and it's right. It can be very comfortable according to the thickness or the style or whatever, but wool is not just a winter material. Yeah. Wool is a beautiful material. It's hypoallergenic. It's thermoregulating. It biodegrades. There's so many beautiful qualities to this just natural material that we have had available to us. Since the beginning of America, really before the beginning, then, yeah, so far the beginning before America, of-, <laughs> of course. But I mean, like the wool is so integrally entwined with American yes economics. Yes, oh yes. uh, yeah. So it's interesting that we have this beautiful thing right in front of us, and I feel like it makes sense. Yeah, leave it to us that it's creating the magic. Yeah, I think that was created far before us. Imagine it's also <laughs> flame retardant. <laughs> naturally right. yes Just, yes oh, it is that's amazing you were speaking about the wool and the sheep and the domestic animals what type of sheep is it merino yes the sheep are i'll get a little technical here because i want to play these sheep are the stars of this show with our sweaters so it's a breed called rembrulet yes and it's a merino breed And they're a cross. So they're hardy for the type of environment that they graze on in the United States. And really important to match the animals with the place. And so they're a good combination of an animal that has a good meat and a good amount of meat for the meat animal. But also they produce beautiful wool. And then Over time, Seneca Wool Company, who we work with, they've actually expanded. So they're working with a co-op of multiple different ranchers who are all ranching the same breed of sheep. But through their breeding programs, they've been able to achieve micron levels of the wool, which is the fineness of the fiber. And that a lot of times equates to the softness of the fiber in addition to other things, but it definitely contributes to the softness. They've been able to achieve some of the finest wool fiber that's ever been produced or grown in the United States, which is super exciting. We're able to get really beautiful wool from them and they're continuing to expand, which is great because it's expanding the amount of acres that are being grazed regeneratively and also expanding the supply of this beautiful fiber. So if we're the only brand that is consuming this fiber at the scale that we're at, we can have some impact and we can certainly have a big influence by talking about it and inspiring others to walk down some of the same path. But ultimately, we need other brands who bring more scale. And so if there's more supply, then there's no excuse for not tapping into that, even just from a quality perspective of the quality of the fiber that's being produced, which, as Janessa said, is very luxurious. It makes a lot of sense. The soil is so nutrient dense. These sheep are grazing on these grasses and they're eating all of the grass from the soil. They're getting the highest like nutrient density of sheep that I know of. And that is coming through in their fibers. It just, it, it like makes perfect sense to me. And yeah. we can see that in such a tangible form and it's really cool. And these sheep are in California? 
Actually, there are sheep in Eastern Oregon. There okay. are some in Northern California. There are some in Utah. Okay. I'm probably going to miss a state here yeah. because Jeannie Carver has been working really hard expanding. And it seems like every time we talk with her, she's excited because there's a new ranch that she's just certified to her standards and cool. to the responsible wool standard, which we also use that Textile Exchange wrote. But she seems to constantly be yeah. working to expand it. And she's got a passion for supporting the American wool industry as well and really supporting growers in the United States with a pre paying a premium for the premium fiber mm -hmm. that they're mm -hmm. producing, which otherwise would just end up being sold on a commodity wool market versus being sold into this more specialized market where we can actually recognize that regenerative work that the ranchers have been committed to. So they need to demonstrate data that shows conclusively the increase in the carbon sequestration on their land. Is that how that works? Eventually, yes. Not a criteria for them to be able to come into the co-op. Actually, for them to come into the co-op, they have to be able to be certified to the responsible wolf standard, which covers animal welfare and a lot of other aspects. In addition, they have to be able to demonstrate that they're using regenerative practices and how long they've been using regenerative practices. So they have a grazing plan, things like that. And then they submit to having their soil sampled. But as Janessa said, you want to measure that over a period of time. And we don't want to keep ranchers out who have been using all of these practices, who have been complying with all of the standards but just don't necessarily have a year's worth of measurements yet. So what Jeannie does is she brings them into the co-op based on them being able to be certified to the responsible wool standard, which is a baseline. And then in addition, the practices that she has in place for regenerative grazing, and then they begin measuring at that point in time. Some mm -hmm. of them have already partnered with universities and things like that to start those measurements their, themselves before joining the co-op. But this is something that they're continuing to do once they join the co-op as well. And eventually the goal is that there's clear carbon measurements for every single ranch that's in the co-op. I think the last time I got numbers for how many acres of land are being grazed regeneratively within the co-op, which was maybe a couple of months ago, could have changed since then, was over 2 million acres oh, wow. of land That's in the awesome. United States that because of this work is under regenerative grazing. So think about the impact yes. that can have in a positive way. Are these small ranches and big ranches? Are they all sizes? Yeah, all sizes. Wow. Some smaller, some bigger. It doesn't matter the size of the operation. I think all are welcome as long as they're committed to these practices. Do you guys do any work with Fiber Shed? We don't do any work currently directly with Fiber Shed, mm -hmm. but Fiber Shed definitely has an influence on the practices that have been used. Yeah. So a lot of that comes through textile exchange. Mm. And Textile Exchange is known as one of the leading organizations in terms of standards development and expertise okay. in that area. Fiber Shed's a big part of that. Yeah. Rachel, I'm interested in your experience working with these really big brands on this stuff and then coming to the started your own consulting, as you said. So can you talk about what that's been like? And I imagine, I'm just assuming that you must be able to feel like you could do more on a smaller scale. I don't know. But can you tell us a little bit about what that's been like. Yeah, I think in general, the really interesting thing is that in working with some really well-known and large brands that have a huge scale in their supply chain, certainly the opportunity with that huge scale, there's opportunity to make huge mistakes and to yeah. have a huge negative impact. But at the same time, on the flip side of that, when you get a brand with as much influence as some of the huge brands that are out there have, and they commit to progressing in the right direction in their supply chain and having an influence in the supply chain, they can make huge impacts in a positive way too. And because of their scale, sometimes in some ways it's almost easier because of the scale, because you have so much influence in mm -hmm. your overall supply chain. So I think it's not 
good or bad in a large organization versus a small organization. The way I see it is that there's opportunity for all organizations to be involved in the solution. And I think the biggest thing to focus on and what I've really learned myself is that it's about making progress, not about perfection. Any industry has a negative impact, has some impact on the planet in some ways, doing some of the things that we're doing in our supply chain, we're able to test some things out that maybe a larger brand couldn't do because they're going to need to make let's say 100,000 sweaters. And if we need to make 100 sweaters, we can do that and test out this theory and test out this supply chain and prove that it can be done. And then it's a matter of scaling it that other larger brands can do the same thing. At Patagonia, we used to say, we're here to prove that it can be done. And then the influence that we can have on other companies is by saying, hey, we did it. And now it just needs to be scaled. So yeah. I think the contrast for me is really just around at large scale, you can have a big impact by doing something that seems to be pretty small. In a smaller organization or a smaller brand, we have other opportunities to test things out and to take some risks. And I think all in all, the most important thing to remember is whether it's small or large, we want to be moving in the right direction and make progress, not be focused on perfection or 100% sustainable because it's just, that's a myth. It's not something that's necessarily achievable. And we also want to continue to challenge ourselves to raise the bar and continuously improve. I don't think you ever quite arrive at yeah. like a landing place where it's okay, now we've done it. We don't need to yeah. do anything else. We need to keep working at it. So now that I have you here, you're a representative of a large brand, the inside scoop. Why doesn't every brand do this? Does it come down to solely profits? Patagonia is different because they're so globally minded right. that way. But is that really all it is or is it just super complex? We just couldn't understand big companies. <laughs> Why aren't they doing the right thing? I guess. Just that little question. <laughs> Personally, and having seen behind the curtain, I call it in a lot of organizations, what I'll say is that I think in some companies, it could be profit. They see profit as being more important. I don't think that's across the board, though, to be honest. Okay. I think that the problem is very complex. Problem of impact on the planet is very complex. And I think it's when we try to oversimplify that problem that it can be really easy if you haven't seen behind that curtain to want to point the finger and say, hey, how come these guys aren't doing more? And there are a lot of brands out there that aren't all that vocal about what they are doing. They're just out there doing the right thing, trying to make progress. They know that they still have a ton of work to do. There's still a lot of cleanup to do. There's still a lot of things that they need to work out and change. So they're not maybe that vocal externally about what they're doing. And then there's brands out there that frankly don't care. And that's the reality too, right? I'm not going to gloss over on that because there are. Yeah. But I think in general, it is a very complex problem and the solution to it isn't any one thing. Right. There's a lot of different aspects to making progress at a brand level on environmental impact, impact on people, things like that. And so I think with Janessa, what we've chosen to focus on is this place with regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing, where we see the opportunity to align that raw material with the products that we want to make and future products we want to explore, bringing those beautiful materials into. And we know that we can do that. Our brand is in a position to be able to do that really well. And on top of it, we know that these practices are healing, not just sustainable. That's the reason we've chosen this particular path. I've seen even, I've, we've been in business for eight years, and I've gone through the different parts of this business. And being able to be agile and make a shift when we were a $5 million company is very different than being agile and making a shift in a supply chain for our current revenues. It's so much easier and it's still not easy. Like to say this is easy is actually laughable. But to look forward and to create the supply chain going forward and be like, these are the products that's back into it. Let's start with the raw materials and let's look ahead 
And we have some five plus year lead times on some things that we're trying to create because it takes that long to produce this. It would be so much more difficult for us to go back and to just turn a lever on a current supply chain that, you know, we need that revenue to bring to keep the business running. That's fueling the change for these other categories. So as businesses grow, it is very hard to pivot very quickly when those supply chains are set. So I'm definitely one where I think that I'm in the same mind as Rachel, where there's some people that are just always going to be for profit. Those are the people that I'm really interested. Those are the business like entrepreneurs and CEOs and executives that I'm really interested in affecting with this. Because if we have an opportunity to change the customer profile, we drive the demand, then the market is going to change their mind because they're going to say, I don't care about that. That's what the customer wants. And that's where the profit's at. And that's when we start getting the Amazon, Google level of change that I think is coming. I think it has to come. Speaking to the complexity of the supply chain and all the many levels and all the many variants that go into this, we often say you can't check all the boxes. You have to choose some. You have to choose some that you have to compromise in some places. What are the boxes that are the highest priority for you? You've probably already said it, but it would be interesting to hear it condensed and articulated. What are your highest priority? Non-negotiables. Yeah, goals. I think, Janessa, feel free to jump in here, but I'll say a couple of thoughts first. For us, it's really about choosing supply chain partners who are aligned with the same values that we have as a brand. And also, to Janessa's point, who are in a position to either grow themselves or they're already at a scale that they can support the growth of the business and the growth of the demand that we are seeing for the brand. We could have the perfect supplier or a seemingly perfect supplier that hits all of the boxes that we have in terms of our values around environmental responsibility or social responsibility and regenerative agricultural input. But if they can only produce a very small quantity of product and our demand is much higher than that, then that's difficult from a business perspective. We still need to run a healthy business. To boil it down the way I see it is seeking out supply chain partners who see the same vision that we do, who understand what we're trying to achieve and want to be a part of achieving that. We're able to get a lot of leverage with supply chain partners based on alignment to those values and alignment to that goal without having the leverage of a lot of volume to start with, which has been great. Yeah. I go back a little bit, even more like a 30,000 foot view. I look at like, like the fruit that they're bearing. How do they treat their employees? How do they treat my employees? What are their like value system? You can get a lot of how people treat their employees. And if they're going to treat their employees well, they're most likely driven by an ethos that I support. So if they can say all the right things and yeah, we're regenerative and yeah, we believe in sustainability and yeah, we believe in all these. But if at the end of the day, the way they lead is not in alignment with that, because mm. it's going to be a, a very difficult partnership going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever fired a supply chain partner? Oh, <laughs> hot topic. Yeah, I definitely have. And one of which was a really big, something that we really had to put our money where our mouth was and we didn't feel like it was aligned and we pulled the trigger and just, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to concede. These are the reasons why I haven't taken the investments because that would not be something that would be allowed right. with other people's money. But we have to be convicted and we have to be like true to our mission if we're trying to do this yeah yeah that's impressive yes <laughs> i think that back to your original question though like to janessa's point it's really important in any business to be really clear about what is it that we stand for what are our values and some people could say oh you sit in a conference room and you write down these values and you write down your purpose and you never look at it again no the reason why you think about that. And the reason why you come up with those values and set it to those convictions that we have as business is because you are going to encounter difficult decisions that have to be made. Do you fire a supply chain partner because they're no longer behaving in a way that's consistent with the values that you have as a brand and that you want to stand for as a brand? That's a really tough decision to make. It has impact on your business. Yeah. But when you ultimately come back to, okay, what is it that we're here to do? 
what is our goal and what are the values that we want to guide our decisions and our behaviors as we're building this business and as we're working towards these goals that we have. And we want to be consistent to that. And I think for any business, that's a really healthy thing to focus on because there's always going to be tough times and there's always going to be hard decisions that have to be made. And they're not all black and white or cut and dry. But ultimately, if you're making them in accordance with your values that you hold true as a business, then that's like your compass. That's telling you, are we still making progress in the right direction? Does this decision take us forward where we say we want to go? Or does it take us backward? Mm -hmm. Where would we like to be? So when Emma and I first started out, we created a brand of clothing. We did five pieces. And we had all these goals, all these sustainability goals. We wanted to be all biodegradable, no plastic. We had this whole list of things. And we had no idea what we were doing, no idea. But we really stuck to our guns and we produced what we said we were going to produce. And it cost the consumer a whole lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. And we got comments like, what's sustainable about a $250 uh -huh. dress? Who uh -huh. is that sustainable? We, we got that comment. And I think five years down the road, there's a little more understanding about that now. And we talk about it on here a lot. But what I love, what's cool about what you're doing and what I feel is like, that's really smart, is you're literally in the luxury market. So if that's what I wanted to ask you about, Janessa, was talk about sustainability and luxury, because yeah. a lot of people might see those things as conflicting. I can see where those two things would be in contrast historically. And you're talking about luxury yachts and luxury airplanes and these sorts of things. But when we really boil down what luxury is, it is step in step with exactly what we're doing. It is a focus on highest quality materials. It's an understanding and an expectation that it is the best of the best. People who buy luxury buy luxury because it's limited. It's scarce. It's not available to everyone. And it's at a cost. And it has a social, the cultural moment in as much as it is an actual piece that people are buying. To your point, Emma, people who buy luxury might not be aware, but already shop very sustainably. They're mm -hmm. shopping something that in by definition has to be made using the utmost quality materials by the most skilled artisans in very low quantity of it being produced because you cannot have luxury that is mass produced and available for everyone. It, by essence, it would no longer be luxury. And so I think luxury and sustainability are step in step as it pertains to the essence of it and the essence of what actually historically when we're looking at what luxury has meant in different cultures and how we've gotten here and what the ethos of luxury is. I think it, it's absolutely synonymous. Yeah. Oh, that's very well put. It's the same way that this going in my mom's backyard and picking a raspberry off the raspberry bush and eating it for dessert is luxury. Yeah. Exactly. Think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because we're at a cultural moment where everything has been, we've had eras of abundance and we've marketed to that and yes. we have gotten we've become accustomed to produce more sell more and that's the moment of how businesses have been and everyone's mindset is like more and more and we've lost track of the source of things and right now the majority of people i'm very hyper aware and intentional of everything that i consume from body products to food to things that i've purchased to how my house is curated everything is very thought out but it's difficult to do it that way. Sometimes when I'm going on a trip and I want a dress for such occasion, I live in Los Angeles, so I know that Beverly Hills is right there and I could go and have anything that I want is just available to me. And it's so easy to take away from the origin to the end product. Just we're very accustomed to being hungry and you can go get food. You'd no longer really have to think of where did this come from? Mm. That requires discipline and that requires thought because it is just abundantly available for us all. And it's just at our fingertips. And so now I think we're going into a finite, we're at a cultural moment that there is not just an overabundance. And I'm going to go into a doomsday of where we're heading, but things are becoming finite. Resources are finite now. Mm -hmm. People are aware, and they've always been somewhat finite, but People are now aware of how scarce things are 
So I feel like we're positioned and if more people get on board, the ethos and the the quality of things that people focus on is in the raw materials, in the ability for it to last. We no longer look at like suiting as something that's going to last generation to generation that you then size down for your kid and keep like going down the line from dad to son because the material is so good. We don't have materials that are lasting that long and we don't get the ability to do that. So I think that now that we're entering into a finite world where there are legitimate scarcities that we're up against, they're going to be forced, whether they like it or not, they're going to be forced to look at things a little bit differently and see the innate value of the raw materials, of the food, of everything that they're consuming. Yes. Oh, I agree with all of that so much. That's so insightful. It gives us so much to think about. This conversation is so important and it's just important that we keep talking about it and that it's not about in order to be more sustainable, you have to buy luxury because I think it's easy to say, it's easy to feel excluded from that category if that's not part of your reality or something that you, my thinking is even just me personally I overconsume in certain things. And if I looked at a line sheet and was like, oh, I spent this much on this, I could afford one of these that's going to last me longer. That's another category. That's another story. (laughs) But my point being is that like with the raspberries and the caring about the people and the material, that's the luxury. Mm -hmm. And however Mm -hmm. you're able to access that, whether it's purchasing the end product or it's being a part of that supply chain or if it's growing something in your own backyard or knitting your own sweater from yarn that you find either locally or online. There's so many ways to be a part of that. Well, I love it. I've never considered myself a luxury person, but after this conversation, (laughs) I'm like, oh, yes. Live that luxurious life. Yes. It's very true. Like, Luxury is not solely Chanel. Right. Luxury is time. It, like at yeah. the end of the day, luxury is time. That's the most scarce resource we all have. So yes. if we're talking about scarcity and we're talking about value and where you spend your time and how you spend your time and your thoughts, like that's the luxury. And I think it's a recontextualizing of what we're really talking about, what this really means. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also a rethinking of just the whole idea of accessibility. Mm-hmm. that as human beings, accessibility is bigger than just what can you buy? What can, what you, can buy? you buy and right. how cheaply can you exactly. get it being the high yeah. value? It's more about information yes. and community and a clean earth, a healthy earth, which is mm-hmm. that's on all of us. Yeah. And good dirt. <laughs> good dirt. We do have a right to good soil because that's the yeah. fundamental thing of all life. So when we're thinking about, and this is going beyond, I think, probably the purview of what most consumers are thinking about on a daily basis, but purpose of this podcast is to try to help people think about their choices on very fundamental things like good soil, mm-hmm. dirt. But anyway, that's a good segue into, I think, each of you tell us what does slow living mean to you and how are you able to embrace that concept into your current lives? For me, slow living is giving yourself the permission to pause and slow down and being able to be very intentional. And I think that I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a founder. I have a team of people that I lead. It's a constant fallacy to fill my time and to fill, be busy and constantly take all these meetings. And it's actually harder for me to slow down to the point that I have to schedule times on my calendar of like the blocks on my calendar for breathing. Like the simplicity of breath has to be put onto my calendar or else it's going to get booked up with a Zoom about financial reports or probably with Rachel and supply chain issues (laughs) and banging our head on the wall about why we decided to do this in the first (laughs) (laughs) place. But it's really about being intentional about what's being consumed from media to relationships and what you're allowing in and understanding that everything is having this like outward reverberation. Nothing is without a cost. And it's being really intentional about what you're choosing to spend your time and how you're choosing to spend your thoughts. And for me, if you just slow down, 
you already have all the answers of what you need. We just need to slow down a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it's, I take it quite literally. I have a couple business mentors and they're like really accomplished CEOs and leaders. And they're always begging me to become like, they're just like, clear your schedule. Like we want you to be the laziest leader, or at least to look like you're the laziest leader. Right. You should not be having these schedules, like these things. I know that you need to slow down. You can't possibly be thinking at a high level and like strategizing and doing what's best for myself and therefore the business if I'm constantly on the defense and my energy is not coming from me and I'm not proactively putting that forward. And so Mm -hmm. that comes with pause. Yeah. Very good. Rachel, what about you? I used to be a complete workaholic. I still have very workaholic tendencies. And so for me, slow living really comes back to As Janessa said, being intentional, time is my most precious resource. And there are some things in life that have taught me very specifically how important time really is and how I spend my time and who I get to spend my time with, whether it's time that I'm working or time that I'm with my family, but just being very aware and intentional about where I'm spending that most precious resource that I have. It's not about getting more, attaining more, achieving more. I want to be doing things and spending my time in a way that is really true to my own personal purpose and my own personal values. So that's also very luxurious. I think (laughs) it feels that way to me. And I think something else is really that I have to remind myself of, but that really proactively making the decision to be inactive to have time where I am not committed to a meeting. I am not filling my time with a chore or something to achieve. It's just spending some time being intentionally inactive, intentionally at rest. And I think that's where, for me, some of my most strategic and most creative ideas and a lot of clarity really comes during those really still times. That's slow living for me in the midst of a really busy world and a lot of stuff going on. (laughs) Yes. What does the good dirt mean to you? And you can take that literally or metaphorically, whatever it means to you. I focus a lot on making myself as robust as possible so that I can overflow onto all of the things in my life. So quite literally, good dirt for me is my raw materials of myself my ability to fill myself up, my ability to be intentional, have this slow living, be able to overflow my vessel. That's how I keep Mm -hmm. seeing it. I'm really intentional with my time and my energy. I have a point system that my, it's not mine, it's my therapist, but it's genius. She gives me, it's actually a coin system because I'm money motivated. Who would have thought business (laughs) owner be money motivated? But it's six coins a day. I've I've delegated like creativity for me. Yes, it's an extraordinarily beautiful, positive charge for my life, but it takes something from me because I'm putting something that's inside of me out into the world. And that's two coins, a difficult conversation with a parrot three coins because that's difficult. A really hard conversation with an employee is a coin. So when I'm done with my six coins, I'm done and I have to go and then I have to fill myself back up. And so I have things that fill myself back up. The beach, my dog, nature, get out into nature. That's my number one resource. So for me, it's just the ability to be someone that has such innate value of the what makes me like my genesis and that's my dirt. That's my good dirt. That's what I can give back into the world and that's what can come out and hopefully make other people's lives a little bit better and easier, happier, more joyous, and be a little bit more of a light to people. Okay. (laughs) That was the best thing I've ever heard. Love the coin. Just kidding. Oh my gosh. You just changed my life, Janessa. (laughs) Okay. So you give your... Okay. Give myself coins, guys. Give yourself coins. You get six coins back a, a coin. So you're like, oh, I'm out of coins. And you go on a hike and you get a coin back. Or yeah. You- so I have to. Yeah. But then I don't get to spend any more coins. It's not like okay. I can. It's not like I can go back and make up seven points. So okay. I can spend another coin. <laughs> okay. so I get six coins a day. Okay. And I have to refill the coins. If I get a bad night of sleep, I forgot to say this. I'm already out of the gate minus <gasps> two coins. If I don't sleep That's well, smart. I only get four coins that day. So I better like, and if I don't, in order for me to sleep well, I have to do all these things and I have to eat well and I have to go out and I have to exercise and I have to sit Mm -hmm. on the beach. I have to watch the sunset. I'm someone that needs actual light on my eyeballs. 
Who would have thought that humans actually need light on their eyeballs yeah. in the morning and in the night? <laughs> yeah. I had, It's like a very structured way I send my time. And I've done it the other way. I've burnt out, which is no good for anyone. I, yeah. I can't be of any sort of resource to any person on the planet when I am just completely depleted. So the coin system works for me. And it's also a really good excuse to get out of a conversation that you don't want to have. Because you're like, I'm out of coins. Let's see this tomorrow. <laughs> so are they, <laughs> Sorry, are they actual coins? I mean, they is... typically carry a, a little, like, <laughs> <laughs> what's the guy in Peter Pan with the little thing of marble? Oh, I have yeah. a little pouch of marbles with me. I wake up in the morning and know I have six to spend that day. And that then to intentionally smart. decide how I want to spend them. <gasps> okay. I love this. <laughs> All right. Well, my mom used to, when we were little, it was, go ahead. And cool this. It was a pitcher of water and we would make her mad when we'd be fighting or something. She didn't want to discipline us anymore. So she'd just pour the water out into a bowl and we'd be like, oh my gosh, mom's pouring water out. <laughs> like her so energy. I, <laughs> you didn't tell the whole story. Sorry, I would explain I that the pitcher of the water was my energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be over there squabbling and I would pour like, the water into a bowl and they would see the water and they'd go, oh no, mom's losing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was super effective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a very genteel way to raise your children. I did not, unfortunately, I did not get that, that lovely was, water metaphor. It wasn't all like that. <laughs> <laughs> That was just one good idea. And I think she did it like a couple of times and I think we would just make fun of her for it for the next 30 years. 40. <laughs> Continuing <laughs> on forever. Yeah. Anyways, I like sorry. the like menacing visual of it though. Yeah. Just like she really... you in the corner just like pouring water yeah. out of a jug. It was refreshing not to have to say anything. Yeah. To, to make the impression. But anyway. Yeah. Okay. Rachel. What does it good mean to you, Rachel? Following Janessa's definition, which is so inspiring. For me, I look at it literally, actually. I grew up in a really agricultural area, went off and started working in this apparel industry away from all of that. And now I'm back. And I see good dirt as being really healthy soil that can support really great plant life that provides good food, that helps clean carbon out of the air, that supports biodiversity above and below the soil. It's the lifeblood of our planet, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we get food, clothing, shelter. Like we don't have healthy soil, then that's it. We can't get anything that we need. So for me, I think of that immediately. And I guess more figuratively, I'm always trying to learn new things. I'm always interested in information. And more figuratively, it would be access to really great new learning opportunity or some good new nugget of information or some new research that somebody did that is really interesting and being able to get the good dirt mm -hmm. on what's going on. A really great podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A really great Friday. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. This has been so wonderful. Is there anything else that you feel like you want to talk about or that you want to leave with our audience about the work that you're doing? A, I just feel so grateful that when I met Rachel, like she had just left Patagonia and I'm like, you want to come and work with me? And you're just like, what? I didn't understand it. But I just, at this point, we're several years in and really being able to bring our first product category to life. The sweaters are our first product category. We now have leather handbags and we have another sweater line launching this fall, it feels, I just am so excited about the opportunity to inspire people, mainly business owners, to look at this and be like, you can do this differently. We're doing it profitably. We're able to actually make a business that's not, I don't, like I said, I do not have investors. There's no possible way for us to do this unless it makes money. Like the business has to make, it has to have a, a use case in the world or else I don't have money myself that's like funneling into this. This is what we're doing. So I feel really excited about the opportunity. I feel excited about the potential. I feel excited about where this is all going. And I think what I would love to just say to anyone who's interested or who's listening and who feels, oh, but I don't have a fashion brand and I can't do this or I don't get to make that impact. You literally have three meals a day that you get to vote every single day of what you're going to put in your body. And we don't need legislation to come in and we don't need the government to tell us how we're going to eat and regulate agriculture. I don't think so. I know it's a controversial thing to say. I think we as consumers, we drive the demand. We say what we're going to allow people to put on our food. We're going to vote with it with our dollars. 
And if you go locally, you don't, I live in LA, we have an egregious grocery store here called Air One. You don't have to go to Air One. You go directly to <laughs> your farm. And the way in which cost difference, yes, it's higher. It's higher because it's quality, it's food, it is people's lives, it's people's livelihoods, it's animals. It is so much more than just quantifying it down to a dollar amount. And I think that's what I would love people to inspire. Just slow down, be a little bit more intentional, eat locally. When you next time you buy your next thing, like for one thing out of the next 10 things you buy, just consider where was it made? Where, mm -hmm. Who's making it? Who's behind it? Where mm -hmm. did this come from? How did it get here? Mm -hmm. Just start, keep notice, start to track where everything is coming from. And I think that it's really going to be eye-opening for a lot of people and they'll be able to quickly start to change some consumer habits. And I think that's how this all changes. Yes. Amen. Sister. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and where can we find you guys and yeah. all of those things you want people to go look for? Yeah, our website is JanessaLeone.com. We're on Instagram at Janessa Leone. And it's a relatively unique name, so... Luckily, it's easy to find. Yeah. <laughs> you could probably just type in like J hats and we'll, hopefully we'll come up. If our SEO, if, if our marketing is doing a good job, hopefully. <laughs> just curious what sells the most. What is your, what do you feel like is your bread and butter? Right now, our hats are still, I mean, the hats are what we started with. So mm -hmm. that's still the majority of what we're known for and what we move. Yeah. But we have other categories sneaking in there that are growing and it's a, a very exciting time. So exciting. Yes. Yeah. We can't wait to follow along. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today in this amazing conversation. I've loved Thank it. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. You both are lovely. I love this mother-daughter energy. It's so <laughs> warming. It's so yeah. kind. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you for tuning in to the Good Dirt Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll share it with a friend to spread the good dirt. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community, and the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at We Are Lady Farmer. That's We Are Lady Farmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye. <laughs>